It is a pleasure now to present a person of the first kind, uh, Professor Richard Carr from Berkeley, who is also a distinguished visiting professor in this department. Probably all of us know what he did. I will not speak up much about it, or maybe not. It, what's called, he deserves no introduction. <laughs> but I just say that he is, he got a Turing Award in the past, so he's a more important person, and we are very, I'm very, very pleased to be able to present him here. He will give a talk on Understanding science through lens of computation, and again, it's a pleasure to invite you. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Congratulations, Azaria. I had planned on telling a few jokes, but I don't know whether they've already been told in Hebrew, so <laughs> I, uh, I won't attempt to do that. But I will say that I was. Uh, Tremendously touched by that movie that your daughter put together, a movie of your life. And it reveals that you have been a successful human being in every way possible. Raising a family, serving your country, serving the Technion, contributing to science, uh, leading the department through sometimes difficult times. Uh, the Technion and the computer science department here would not be what they are today, which is a very high standing in the field, uh, if it were not for you. And probably we wouldn't be sitting in the Taub building because it wouldn't exist if it were not for you. So for all of those things, I, I admire you very much and wish you happy returns on this occasion. I want to talk about uh, a sort of point of view about uh, how computer science can uh, contribute to other fields, uh, physical science, engineering, uh, even economics and, social sci and other social sciences. Um, if we look at the history of how computation has served the sciences, uh, we, we can see several phases. Uh, initially, the, we have the classical scientific computing where uh, uh, computing methods are developed and applied uh, to solve systems of, of equations formulated by natural scientists, which often take the form of uh, ordinary and partial differential equations or uh, systems of linear equations, etc. Et more recently, there was um, a lot of emphasis on the use of uh, simulation processes uh, together with virtual reality and visualization tools uh, to understand scientific phenomena by actually simulating them in cases where they couldn't be solved in, in closed form. And so a lot of work in design of aircraft, analysis of weather, and many other very difficult phenomena has been studied by this combination of simulation and visualization. Uh, more recently, uh, we have the emergence of what's called e-science, um, in which Scientific phenomena are studied in cases where vast amounts of data have to be gathered. For example, uh, scanning, the, uh, uh, scanning the skies for cosmological information, find, finding new planets and other uh, phenomena which involve gathering and sifting through tremendous amounts of data. This occurs in climate science, meteorology, uh, in the world of business and so forth where uh, scientific methods uh, where science, uh, the science of analyzing data comes into play often in distributed systems with immense data sets. What I want to talk about today is a uh, slightly different relationship between computation and 
science, which we call the computational lens. In this viewpoint, we are not merely using compute computation as a tool for solving scientific models, but we're thinking of it as a means of actually creating those models. In other words, we want to look at the natural processes that occur in some scientific field uh, and view them as algorithms. These algorithms might be regulatory networks in living cells, uh, they might be mechanisms in economics, they might be uh, markets in economics or uh, mechanisms for bidding on contracts. Uh, they might be societal systems where we can measure uh, uh, what's going on in a social network in great detail and analyze the dynamics of the social network. So the idea is that in these cases and others that I'll talk about, we're not just viewing computation as a tool but we're viewing computational, computation as a means of modeling. So that, for example, in molecular biology, if we look at what's going on in a cell, uh, we think of the cell not only as a transducer of energy, uh, uh, but also as a collection of, computa of interlinked computational processes that are regulating the work of the cell. So what I want to do in this talk, it'll be a rather broad survey is talk about this viewpoint as it is applied uh, to uh, a number of uh, fields, in each case sort of describing uh, a novel kind of interaction between computation um, and a field of science. Let's see. So here are just a few examples of uh, processes in the sciences that uh, uh, can be reviewed uh, can be viewed as uh, computational systems. Um, many many examples from biology at all levels: regulation of protein production, metabolism, and embryonic development. Mechanisms of learning: we hardly understand what goes on in the brain, but we're uh, able to gather more and more data and uh, analyze at least small uh, systems of neurons. Um, we can view the phase transitions of physical systems as a kind of dynamical process that, could, that is a, a similar to an algorithm in which uh, uh, systems of uh, interacting atoms develop uh, in some way. Uh, the, in, the response of the immune system, the collective behavior of animal communities, things like the uh, flocking of birds or the organization of ant colonies. Uh, in the, in, um, in nanoscience, molecular self-assembly, the processes by which uh, s molecules can be designed to spontaneously come together, bind together to form interesting nanostructures. Economics, the strategic behavior of companies, can be viewed through the lens of game theory. Uh, and many processes that take place by means of the web involving many interacting agents can be thought of as algorithmic processes in which the players are the agents or members of a social network. So all of these lead to new kinds of computational models. And I want to talk about some of these. So since I come from Berkeley, uh, I'm influenced very much by what goes on there and what my colleagues do. So uh, in our theory of computation group, we work on classical things and, and new, th new developments in complexity and cryptography and logic and so forth. But we also look to the sciences for interesting new computational phenomena. Quantum computing, statistical physics, the web, the internet, and computational game theory, and computational molecular biology. I'll be giving examples from each of these areas. Let's start with quantum complexity theory. Scott Aronson, one of our Berkeley graduates, now a professor at MIT, described the study of quantum computers as the study of what we can't do with computers we don't have. What we can't do, because that's 
That's the business of complexity theory, to study the absolute limits on computation. So one branch of the study of quantum computing is to show that uh, there are certain things that even this very strong model of computation can't do. And with computers we don't have because we don't yet know how to build a functioning quantum computer with uh, more than a few uh, units of information. And uh, so we are very far from having uh, uh, an actual industrial technology. So the one of the differences between uh, quantum computation and classical computation is that the in, cl in classical computation, the basic unit of information is the bit, which takes on uh, the value of 0 and a 1. But in uh, quantum computation, the basic unit of information, which could be represented by the spin of an electron, the polar polarization of a photon, or some process at a very minus minuscule level, um, is really a rich amount of information, which in principle is described by two complex numbers. It's kind of a probabilistic mix of the values 0 and 1. And um, the reason that it's so difficult to do things with quantum computation and take advantage of this very rich amount of information is that when, we observe, when an external observer observes a quantum a qubit, which initially is a prob probability mix of 0 and 1, it will collapse, pro collapse probabilistically to one of those deterministic values, 0 or 1. Um, but a, uh, a system of uh, n qubits is somehow in 2 to the nth states at the same time. It's a probability mix over 2 to the nth states. So even a small number of qubits can represent, in principle, a large amount of information. And quantum logic gates perform certain transformations, which happen to be unitary linear transformations on, on these uh, coefficients alpha and beta. So the goal of quantum computing is to exploit the rich information content of qubits for efficient computation, uh, even despite the fact that when we observe these bits, we lose the information about alpha and beta, and they, and they just collapse to 0 or 1. So um, a great boost for quantum computation occurred when Peter Schor gave an algorithm using, uh, in showing that an abstract quantum computer um, can factor large integers in polynomial time. Um, this is an important step because if quantum computers could be realized and could perform factorization of very large integers, then the crypto systems that we use and which are at the foundation of electronic commerce would be broken. And that would break, not, not only would it make, impossible, make it impossible for commerce to continue, but all of the secrets of the past that are based on such crypto systems would also be laid bare. So, this is part of the motivation for really trying to develop quantum computers and to understand what other amazing things they might be able to do. But there's a, a second reason for studying quantum computing, which is that in the attempt to build quantum computers and analyze them, scientists will be building quantum systems of greater complexity um, than have been studied before in the textbooks and, it's, and if there is any flaw in the foundations of quantum mechanics, it's more likely to be discovered. So another possible goal of the study of quantum computing would be to find a flaw and uh, raising the need to refine the underlying theory of quantum mechanics. So there are three possibilities if we ask whether we can build quantum computers. Maybe yes, maybe no because of a thousand annoying pro problems and details. But the third possibility might be that the standard models of quantum physics hold only for tiny numbers of particles, 
And if the third outcome occurs, there will be a revolution in physics. So there are sort of a couple of different ways in which quantum computing uh, could be important. So Umesh Vazirani put it this way, uh, quantum computing is as much about testing quantum physics as it is about building powerful computers. I want to talk now about another area of physics about which I know very little, but from colleagues I learned a little bit about uh, recent developments. This is the uh, connection between statistical physics and computer science. Uh, both of these fields use probabilistic methods to study how macroscopic properties of large systems of interacting entities arise from local interactions. Uh, in statistical physics, these entities might be uh, molecules or atoms that are interacting in various ways. Um, uh, and the phenomena would be things like the freezing of water or the magnetization of magnetic materials. Um, in computer science, we also study large systems with many interacting elements. For example, uh, when we study um, combinatorial optimization problems like the satisfiability problem, um, the interacting elements there are all of the different constraints on the problem. And out of all of those interacting elements, we get a formula which is either satisfiable or not satisfiable. Similarly, in the uh, many activities in the World Wide Web um, involving a lot of competing and cooperating agents can be viewed as a system with many interacting agents, possibly probabilistic in behavior, possibly friendly, possibly malicious, etc. Uh, and out of the interactions of all of these agents emerges uh, some phenomenon. So both of these fields, in a sense, are dealing with emergent phenomena, macroscopic phenomena that de emerge from uh, small-scale interactions. So uh, over the last few years, the computer scientists uh, and the physicists have, been, have started to learn each other's language and develop really fruitful ties between the two fields. Uh, so in statistical physics, we have phase transitions where the behavior of a system changes radically when a parameter goes through a threshold value. Uh, freezing or vaporization of water would be such an example. In computer science, we have something analogous, sharp thresholds, uh, the best known example being uh, the question of satisfiability of random Boolean formulas, uh, where it's known that um, if you take a random Boolean formula with a given number of variables and number of clauses, um, if the ratio of clauses to variables in other words, the ratio of constraints to variables is below a certain threshold. The formula is almost certainly satisfiable, but above that threshold, almost certainly unsatisfiable. So in both cases, we have systems of many interacting components where you have a sharp change as a parameter varies uh, in the behavior of the system. And it turns out that the mathematics of these two kinds of systems is very similar. So just as to give a couple of examples, um, um, a famous algorithm by Jerem Sinclair and Vigoda is a randomized polynomial time algorithm for computing the number of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph. Uh, and it's based on a simulation method called Markov chain Monte Carlo, a sampling method which was originally invented for sampling the states of a physical system with many particles. Um, the best known method for solving random satisfiability problems uh, was invented by statistical physics and combines ideas from statistical physics with the belief propagation technique of computational learning theory. So we see that we get all of these interactions between learning theory, probabilistic analysis of algorithms, and probabilistic analysis of systems of interacting uh, physical particles. Um, let me turn next to uh, the web and the internet. 
Uh, my colleague, uh, Christos Papadimitriou, um, made the following remark, which underscores the importance of the World Wide Web as opening up all kinds of computational phenomena. He said, for the first time, we had to approach an artifact, that is, the web, with the same puzzlement with which the pioneers of other sciences had to approach the universe, the cell, the brain, and the market. So the World Wide Web opens up a whole range of computational phenomena, all different kinds of transactions and interactions that take place over the web uh, and the internet. Uh, and to some extent, it has to be studied empirically in much the same way that physical scientists and biological scientists studied uh, these other systems in the past. Um, so uh, there are many, one, one can say that if the Turing machine is the, was the standard of model of computation in the first 50 years of computer science, perhaps the web will be the standard model of computation uh, in the next decades because our attention is turning so much uh, to systems that involve many agents, not just something with a single input and a single output and a deterministic behavior. Um, uh, so as we, as we study the internet and the web as systems that are simultaneously computational, social, and economic, uh, we get many algorithmic problems, ranking methods for search engines, reputation systems, recommendation systems, design of auctions and other economic mechanisms, uh, optimal placement of advertisements. All of these involve um, interactions among multiple agents. Um, one of the areas is, uh, of interest is uh, sociology, uh, where sociologists who never really gathered large amounts of data in the past, um, the most that they could do would be study a class of 30 children in the schoolyard and trying to understand the social interactions among them. Now, through Facebook and other social networks, uh, get enormous amounts of data about the interactions of enormous amounts of, enormous amounts of participants and uh, all kinds of questions about understanding these interactions uh, need to be studied from the point of view of uh, viewing them as algorithms, possibly randomized algorithms. How do ideas, opinions, innovations, and technologies spread in a network? How do the opinions of individuals depend on the individuals of the people they communicate with? what kinds of epidemics of information uh, sweep over a social network. How do you identify coherent communities? Uh, how do you understand and exploit the six degrees of separation phenomenon? Uh, all of these uh, can be now studied in real life systems. Uh, there's the, uh, the issue of the wisdom of the, of the crowds. How can we extract meaning and knowledge by sort of interrogate interrogating the fellow members of our social networks. So uh, this is a whole new chapter in computer science, a whole new set of phenomena to study. Um, related to this is uh, economic mechanism design. Uh, the Nobel Prize was recently given to some e economists for uh, formulating the first theories of mechanism design a few decades ago. Uh, an economic mechanism is an algorithm whose inputs come from economic agents with private data and selfish interests. Uh, so examples would be uh, an online auction, uh, for example, bidding for Google ad placement. Uh, the goal of an economic mechanism is to induce the participants to respond in ways that we desire, possibly to get them to maximize the revenue that we get, to maximize the social effectiveness of the networks that they interact on, um, um, uh, maybe simply getting them to tell us the truth about their preferences. Uh, so economic mechanism design is aimed at uh, devising mechanisms that will induce this kind of behavior. Uh, for example, in a road network, uh, how can we induce drivers to 
by providing them with online information, uh, induce them to take the routes that will optimize the overall throughput of the road network. Um, there are many problems of this type. Uh, another related uh, development is the growing importance of game theory in analyzing uh, economic mechanisms and, and markets. So game theory was founded by uh, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern uh, as a theory of strategic behavior in situations of conflict. And there were attempts to apply it to the arms race, to market pricing, to uh, bidding in auctions. Um, game theory hasn't been entirely successful because uh, very often uh, there are, there's more than one solution uh, which can be thought of as rational. And, uh, and so game theory doesn't always give a unique indication of how individuals should behave if they want to behave rationally. Classical game theory assumes that the participants are perfectly rational and the concept of rational behavior that um, they, um, uh, that is usually uh, set forth is the so-called Nash equilibrium. Well, the setting is something like this, as many of you know. Um, in each game, each of the players has a set of possible actions and there's a payoff to each player which depends on the actions of all of the players. Um, it's assumed that the these so-called payoff matrices are known to all of the players. Um, and players then follow strategies. They choose their actions. These may be mixed strategies. They may choose, um, they may play probabilistically. For example, if you're playing a game of matching pennies, uh, you would, uh, the best thing to do would be to randomize between heads and tails because if you play deterministically, uh, your strategy could be beaten. Um, um, a Nash equilibrium is defined as a, an assignment of mixed strategies, randomized strategies to all of the players such that if the other players, if, all, if you are a player and all of the other players stick to their mixed strategies, you would know, have, have no motivation for changing from yours. So a Nash equilibrium is a set of mixed strategies where everybody is behaving as well as he can, uh, subject to given the behavior of the others. Um, as I say, the Nash equilibrium has been uh, criticized because um, there may be many of them for a given, uh, uh, for a given uh, situation. It's a theorem that there's always at least one. Um, but uh, in a par apart from that, uh, another criticism has recently been unveiled, which is that, uh, sorry, uh, yes, this is right, um, that if we look at the computational complexity of computing a Nash equilibrium, it turns out to be one of these uh, really hard problems. Um, so the strategic behavior of participants in, a, in an abstract game a situation of conflict might be limited by computational complexity because computing a Nash equilibrium is as hard as some other known difficult problem, computing a Brouwer fixed point. And um, it's, there's every reason to believe that there can't be a really fast algorithm for, in general for computing a Nash equilibrium. So as uh, Kamal Jain put it, if your laptop can't compute it, then neither can a market. How, why should we assume that a market will converge to um, a Nash equilibrium for the participants uh, if the problem is hard to compute? Another phenomenon that is uh, investigated in computational game theory is uh, the price of anarchy, uh, which studies how much you lose by when each participant behave selfishly for his or her own benefit as compared with the socially optimum outcome that would occur if they all agreed on uh, a course of behavior. Uh, there are simple examples in traffic theory where uh, uh, each participant is choosing a route from a source to a destination and um, you can have a, an equilibrium s situation 
where um, every participant is following the route that is most efficient for him given the congestion that's created by the others. And yet that equilibrium situation is far less effective in throughput than some other configuration that the participants would not reach. So uh, computational game theory gives a number of new insights into uh, behavior of selfish individuals competing and cooperating uh, for uh, their goals. Um, we can also talk about the uh, relationship of uh, computer science to the field of mathematics. Here, this is a slightly different kind of relationship. Um, uh, the original Clay Institute Millennium problems um, were seven in number. One of these, the Poincaré conjecture, was uh, subsequently solved. Um, there was a million dollar prize for solving any one of these problems. And of the seven, I believe the one that has the greatest philosophical significance is our own P versus NP problem, which originated in uh, computer science. Um, because you can interpret the P versus NP problem as the question of uh, whether or not it's as easy to find a mathematical proof as it is to check a mathematical proof. And from that point of view, it's, it's kind of a fundamental concept, a fundamental I issue. We've always been trained that a proof is, uh, that you know, proving, finding a proof is, is a creative process that, that sort of comes to you out of the blue and nobody can describe an algorithm for finding a proof. You just, you either get the idea or you don't. Uh, whereas checking a proof is a mechanical syntactic process. And yet, if P turns out to be equal to NP, then roughly speaking, the difficulty of <coughs> finding a proof will be no greater than that of checking a proof. So the problem has great uh, philosophical significance, and it has served to uh, enhance the respectability of computer science in, in, the, in the world of uh, science. Um, so uh, NP-complete problems arise in every field where computation is done. Each year, thousands of papers, even if you limit yourself to the physics literature, uh, refer to NP-completeness. And there are other links between theoretical computer science and pure mathematics. I was really afraid about this slide because I thought that the little children would still be here. <laughs> and uh, I, didn't, I was afraid that I would be using too much technical language, but I see that at the intermission, most of the kids were uh, ushered out of the room, so I feel okay about this. <laughs> um, so um, some of the, 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 the basic notions uh, that have uh, arisen from theoretical computer science, randomized algorithms, computational pseudo-randomness, de-randomization, public key encryption, complexity of factoring, and so on, uh, are, be, are well known, especially to the younger generation of mathematicians, and they even contribute to pursuing these computer science objectives. And theoretical computer scientists use many tools from a variety of branches of mathematics, uh, metric space embedding, expander graphs, random walks, Fourier analysis, spectral decomposition of matrices. So there's a tremendous amount of mixing uh, between, uh, between the two fields. Uh, and we can um, mention links to uh, many other fields, uh, uh, linguistics and anthropology, methods in invented originally in uh, evolutionary biology to study the evolution of species and construct evolutionary trees, uh, can also be used to analyze the evolution of language and migration patterns between populations. Uh, we can study certain phenomena in evolutionary theory, uh, trying to understand what, what Darwin, Darwin had to say more deeply. Uh, in nanotechnology, we can think of the, the way in which labeled molecules diffuse and meet and bind to form deterministic structures as a kind of computation. Uh, in statistics, computational learning theory injects a, an emphasis on efficient computation to um, 
the study of statistical tests, which previously had focused on asymptotic convergence and consistency without paying too much attention to computational complexity. So all of these fields have also been influenced. I'm running short of time, so I'll just uh, close with, uh, uh, one, with, the, with the one area which probably has the greatest range of possibilities of modeling, of computational modeling of phenomena of biology. I mentioned some of these examples earlier, uh, so I won't repeat them. Um, you, can, you can see them. They were listed before. Um, the organization of ant colonies, um, models of living cells, the immune system, flocking of birds, the brain. Can we view the brain as a computer? Will we ever understand what's going on globally in the brain? Um, one area that I've worked on a lot is um, computation, and there are people here uh, at the Technion who have also contributed to this field, um, is the revolution in uh, molecular biology, uh, where we uh, try to understand the behavior of uh, uh, living cells as computational uh, systems. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some of this stuff. Um, in, in view of the time, but here are some of the goals of computational molecular biology. Um, we have been successful and increasingly are successful in sequencing and comparing the genomes of many species. As you know, sequencing technology and the associated algorithms will soon make it possible for people at a fairly modest price to get have their own genomes sequenced. We're not very far from that. Um, within the genomic sequences, we would like to parse them to identify the genes and determine the functions of the proteins that the genes code for. We would like to trace the evolutionary history and evolutionary relationships of existing species. Um, and here's the part that uh, uh, I find particularly exciting. Uh, we'd like to understand how the biomolecules that exist in our cells uh, work together to control cellular processes, to control communication between cells, building the physical structure of cells, um, uh, processing nutrients, uh, uh, reproducing, etc. All of the processes that go on in cells can be thought of as carried out by small molecular machines, in other words, uh, in other words, algorithms. Um, similarly, uh, understanding the structure and function of proteins and identifying the associations between <coughs> genetic mutations and disease. So there are a tremendous number of problems, all of which involve large-scale computation and more than that, modeling of the interactions among molecules that create behavior in cells. So maybe I'll just close with uh, a challenge for the future of biology. Uh, this is a quote from a biologist named uh, Gary O'Dell from the University of Washington. And uh, he, he said, um, we can approach understanding how the whole genome works. I would, I would say not just the genome, but all of the proteins that work together as the products of the genome. We can approach understanding how the whole genome works by breaking it down into groups of genes, I would say proteins, that interact strongly with each other. Once researchers identify and understand these network modules, the next step will be to figure out the interactions within networks of networks and so on until we eventually understand how the whole genome works many years from now. So the, the basic picture is that the cells are sort of vast communities of interacting molecules um, that form structures of co coherently related aggregates of proteins, for example. And these structures interact with, among themselves to form larger scale structures. And we would like to understand all of this as, as, a, uh, as an algorithmic process. So without going into uh, further detail, I'll just uh, close with 
one more slide summarizing what we've tried to, what I've tried to develop in this talk. Um, namely that the algorithmic world view is changing the sciences. In, in the mathematical, natural, life sciences, and social sciences, there are many phenomena that can really be studied as algorithms <coughs> and modeled using the methods of theoretical computer science and introducing new investigations into theoretical computer science. And uh, as our ability to acquire and communicate data about all kinds of systems and enterprises and everyday experiences, the algorithmic worldview will be essential for converting this data to knowledge, insight, and intelligent action. So I'll stop here. Be happy to take some questions, comments. Any questions? Yes, Azaria. What do you think about the future of computational AI? Well, I think AI, the question is, what do you think about the future of computational AI? Well, uh, it seems to me that uh, AI is progressing very beautifully. Um, the, the early generations of AI research were sort of oriented towards logic, that if you could write down all of the axioms and rules of inference of how some process behaves, you could figure out everything about it. But the uh, newer generation is more focused on probabilistic modeling, Bayesian networks, um, uh, you know, looking, looking at uh, complex uh, systems probabilistically. And uh, I think if we could sort of blend the benefits of both of these kinds of uh, both of these approaches that AI will become stronger and stronger. And we keep seeing great, great advances um, in uh, linguistic analysis, as was described in an earlier talk. Uh, a good example is the Watson system that you've probably heard about, uh, the system that IBM developed that can uh, understand uh, human language, including irony, jokes, et cetera, and can compete in the game of Jeopardy as well as human, as the best humans. So I think, you know, if we just look at search, for example, I think we're going to see increasingly intelligent search uh, where um, the search engines will really understand more and more of our intentions. We'll be able to look at our queries and really understand not merely the text that's in the queries, but the real intention behind the query and uh, answer very efficiently. So it seems to me that things will get better and better. Um, not to say that we'll ever achieve uh, a way that we'll ever pass the Turing imitation test. Uh, not, you know, not everything will be possible, but very useful things will be coming out of AI, I believe. Does that make sense to you? Yes? What do you think about Roger Penrose's view that uh, thought is not computational? Well, it's, it's sort of based on the fact that, uh, that our brains are quantum mechanical systems rather than deterministic ones. It's one possibility. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't really know enough about it to say. It doesn't strike me as the most important way of looking at these things, but uh, I don't know a lot about it. Yeah? What's your guess on P versus NP? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, my intuition is that, like everybody else, my in, almost everybody else, my intuition is that P is unequal to NP, but I don't have any rigorous way of supporting that. <laughs> uh, uh, right, uh, but um, I suspect that it will be solved someday, and it will be solved by somebody who doesn't know the things that we think are important, but has some completely different way of looking at it uh, that nobody has thought of. I think it will happen sometime. It will probably be a, a young person, maybe a Technion undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> But it could be a long time. We should keep giving them uh, as exercise this problem. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe if they don't know it's unsolved, they might be able to do something with it. 
Okay, anything else? Thank you very much. Congratulations again. <laughs>